All righty, all righty. I hope you had a very nice lunch. We're going to be talking about AI and AI and our journey. Uh, I uh, did a talk like this in MDC Oslo just six months ago, and I had planned to uh, deliver a similar talk. Uh, in the end, uh, you'll see that there's almost nothing that remains. I've got a, you know, just a few slides. So the whole talk really had to be rewritten. And in Oslo, I went through and I talked about how to build your own uh, AI solution and calling the APIs of Azure and how to make a vector data, database and uh, how amazingly cool it was as essentially is your internal chatbot across any set of data. So during that time throughout our company, there has been a lot of implementations and I can say, like, you know, we've been developing uh, enterprise solutions uh, like pretty much all of us here for a long time. You know, we've been doing it for about 30 years and in the last 12 months has been the, the biggest change for us. And, and it's really touched uh, every person's job in our company and, of course, clients everywhere uh, asking, how do I take advantage of AI? And then I'm going back having meetings in SSW trying to work out uh, the best approach to tell customers based on their different needs. So this is going to be our journey and hopefully uh, you'll pick up uh, bits and pieces because this has touched everyone and will keep touching everyone. Uh, I've structured the talk this way, that I'll go through some AI news first just to get you up to speed. Then we'll go through the no-code solutions, the chat GPT uh, stories and what you can do to use that. And then I want to talk about the low-code custom GPTs and then we're going to get into the enterprise solutions and how we've done that. I've seen uh, a few talks here where they've rolled their own. Uh, I'll be talking about how we did ours. And then we can do a little bit of talking about the future, what might happen. So this is how uh, you have to dress for NDC Oslo. And I got uh, very well prepared for that. And uh, uh, it was a lot of fun. I've got to tell you, I, I've spoken a lot of conferences over the years. Uh, NDC Oslo is my favorite of all places. So if you ever want to like, uh, you know, have a holiday, go to Norway, go to an awesome conference, it's in this huge auditorium. It's like, uh, you know, they have, it's like the old entertainment center where the, the conference is kind of in the center and the sessions are outside. You can probably claim it as a tax deduction. I'm not giving tax advice, but you could, maybe. I'm also one of a few Microsoft regional directors and I blog at adamcogan.com. We have an awesome booth out there uh, near Combank and uh, if you want to, you can scan this QR code. You can collect lots of points. I, I've been, we've had about uh, 600 people go through the shooting and we have 37 people that have got it in. So uh, that is showing me that a lot of software developers aren't very coordinated because you do get 10 shots, okay? So, uh, and you'll get, uh, at the end I'll give you a QR code and you'll get another 800 points or so. All right, so let's talk about AI news first. First of all, how many people have ChatGPT installed on their mobile phone, the app? Okay, so that's about 80%. How many people have it on their home screen? Oh, much less, maybe 40%. Okay, there's your first tip. And uh, how many people have set up custom instructions so it gives better answers? Oh, pretty good, all right, 20 or 30%. All right, good, good, good. So. If you want to keep up to date with this, you can read the OpenAI blog, you can read the amount of information that is coming thick and fast is crazy. Uh, so essentially, uh, you know, a lot of the solutions that you build depends on how much you can give it and how much you can receive. So tokens matter. And um, you know, how many people attended NDC Sydney is essentially broken up like this. How many people attended NDC Sydney? It's essentially one token per word, but not exactly. So when we first started with uh, this in 2022, we had 3.5. The knowledge was out of date. We essentially had a 4K limit and it was 
uh, initially slow, got faster, um, and it was reasonably expensive. In 2023, when we got GPT-4, the token limit increased so we could do better things. Uh, it got pretty expensive, uh, but it got a hell of a lot faster, okay? Uh, now, 2024 is when our knowledge got up, updated and we can do much better things with the token. And the big thing for our enterprise solution is things got a hell of a lot cheaper, okay? So for, I think about 20% of you have set up custom instructions. Uh, this is an oldie but a goodie. You should definitely set this up so that every time you quickly ask it a question, it knows who you are. Every time you paste an email and say, can you suggest a response here? It's got more context, who's what, what's going on. And uh, the news with this is this used to only be in the paid version. So it's now no longer in the paid version. We've all got it, so there's no reason not to set it up. I, I, you know, Yuli in our office uses this a ton, and I ask him, can I show your one? Because I think it's cute. His one is, my name is Ulysses McLaren. I live in Sydney, Australia. People sometimes call me Yuli. I was born here. I have two children, Azalea, born here, and Darius, born here. I have a wife, Jasmine, born here. I'm the general manager of SSW, custom software development, 100 employees, six offices, and here's the offices. So there's work stuff and there's home stuff. And so I said, give me some of the home stuff, because I only ever see him do the work stuff. And this is a real example <laughs> that he had in his history. Jasmine doesn't like the smell of beer on my breath, but I want to kiss her. What can I do? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Darius stole Jasmine's credit card. How can I make sure he knows that's a big deal? Okay, he's not very confident in his parenting abilities. Okay. Work, help me improve this page. Uh, help me make a marketing plan to sell generative AI services. Uh, give me strategic advice on how to improve our partnership with Microsoft, whatever. So there's just, he's using it every step of the way. And in fact, uh, I think that we're all encouraging each other to do all, all the time. So there is, um, it, there is a little bit uh, of news, and this is only the last couple of days. Um, it will now manage your history you know, and it will remember who you are and what you have. So, uh, you know, has a two-year-old daughter named Lena. Uh, loves jellyfish, prefers meeting summaries. You know how every time I ask it, I say put in bullet point form, add numbers, <laughs> put emojis. You know, uh, it will get to know what you prefer, okay? It'll know your favorite countries, et cetera. All right, let's talk about GPTs. And GPTs are, are pretty awesome. You should jump in there and have a look and, and play with that. How many people have already played with some GPTs? Okay, so, you know, 30 or 40%, good. So, jump in here, there is a store. The store will tell you the most popular ones. So, in the past, if you wanted, if you made a GPT, uh, you would have to individually share it. Now, you can put it in there, in the store, and share it with others. So, in our company, uh, the engineers don't like making images, but they have to make it in certain colors, certain styles, and all that. One of the engineers just set up... Um, a GPT that made an image with all the correct colors and the correct styles, and then he shared it, and then other people can just use it, all right? Here's, a, here's an example of one. Sell me this pen. So in this case, he wants to sell a bike. Just plonk the, the image of the bike that he has, and it will say, there's some text you can use. Pretty impressive, I think. So. Uh, you know, you can see it's, um, it's worked out what it is. It's put a whole lot of uh, information in. It will, you know, can go off and, and give some recommendations on some pricing. All right. Multiply 454 with 328. Okay. So I think we've mostly worked out. It's a text generator and it lies, makes stuff up. Is that answer right? usually close. As the numbers get bigger, it's just a text generator. It's 1,000 off here, but you cannot trust it. You don't know if it's, if it's spot on or it's way off. It has no concept of even being close. So if you look at the very bottom there, it says ChatGPT can make mistakes. Consider checking uh, important information. Very important thing. 
Now, with GPT-4, we now have assistance, so we can build these agent-like experiences and that, that will then become more intelligent by using the code interpreter retrieval function calling. So an example of that is in the store, Galileo. So you can uh, ask it any science-based uh, questions and it will create Python code and give you an answer in the background. So for example, you could ask, how many days would it take to drive from Earth to the moon if I was traveling at 60 miles an hour? In the background, it will run off, write the code, and then work out it is 165.87 and respond with, it would take approximately 166 days to drive from Earth to the moon at a speed of 60 miles an hour, okay? So that is awesome. Those problems have been nailed. In addition, if you look at the date there, just a, a week ago, we now have op the OpenAI services supporting assistance, okay? So that now enables us to uh, take advantage of all this stuff on Azure and build uh, proper solutions for ourselves and our companies. Um, I read this and I was kind of blown away you know, Microsoft is now eyeing nuclear energy for its AI ventures because it's causing a lot of consumption. Uh, I actually uh, was lucky enough to have dinner with Scott Guthrie the other day, and I brought this topic up because I was curious, is this real or it was just a fake article? He said, oh, no, no, it's 100% uh, real. It, in fact, uh, I think I word the question in such a way as, are you really using nuclear for your... For your um, data centers. And he said, well, you know, a lot of the our data centers already run on nuclear. You know, Chicago is pretty much uh, fully there. Um, they, are, they are creating new data centers every four days. So this is, uh, and obviously, if one of these things goes down, this, this is terrible for, for us, terrible for society, you know, probably worse than a bank going down. It's pretty big. It would be pretty bad. So they need reliable power and they are now building their own nuclear power stations. Uh, I just find that incredible, unbelievable. Matt threw that slide in, thank you, Matt. Okay. Now, <laughs> I think he's trolling me. So, um, this, is, this is awesome. Uh, Copilot for Azure SQL. I remember many years ago, you might have similar stories, where I was asked to go into a client to look at some performance problem and I thought I'd go in and find out what work they wanted, et cetera. And I turned up and they wheeled me through to some data, uh, server room and there's like six people behind me and I'm just trying to understand. They, you know, one of them was saying, oh, the Microsoft expert is here, he's gonna fix the problems. And I'm thinking, I'm not gonna be fixing any problems, but I was feeling a bit of pressure and I was asking for the code base and what, what's the problem? This page is very slow, it's taking a minute and a half, we don't know. And I had not a clue where to start, what, you know, what, what could be the problem in this? And I just put the, the, um, the open up query analyzer, uh, pasted that in the query plan and said that there was a um, table scan going on. I gave it the, the, one in, the one index to add and the page went down to under a second. And they all thought I was a genius, right? And I knew that I just got lucky because I had not a clue. And uh, I always remembered that experience. And I saw this um, and see on the right, it says, try Copilot with your SQL database. Hello, this is gonna be fun. Why is my database performing slowly? The average CPU usage is over 90% in the last hour. Straight away, you know that that person is in pain when they're running this at this time. We've found two expensive queries. Here's the first one, it looks pretty okay. And it says you need an index on state pr province ID. Okay, so that is essentially that same story, but chat GPT like. Uh, the other one says, you've got an anti pattern in this query. Look at that where clause, unit price times 0.1 greater than 300 and the recommended way is unit price greater than 300 divided by 0.1. Okay, so this is just awesome, like just incredible. I saw a whole lot of the 
examples that uh, Damo did in GitHub um, Enterprise. All this stuff is just phenomenal. So you don't even have to know SQL anymore. Write me a query that finds the most recent orders for customers who have sales over $100,000. So it's, you're saying, just tell me the big orders recently. And that probably would have worked, by the way. And it will go off and it comes back with this. So look at that. It's written the queries. Uh, you can see it's using common table expressions. Uh, you know, you know when developers write SQL and the DBAs always complain because you didn't put selects from where in uppercase? You know? um, it's already done. Developers won't get in trouble anymore. Of course, you, know, you, you don't have to tell anyone you use this and you look pretty good. All right, I, I want to tell you about, um, I've heard a lot of this AI saving lives, AI doing this, AI being some ma magic superpower, blah, blah, blah. Um, I was in the office and uh, Yuli's wife was in neutral bay and was going down to meet her. And I said, oh, what's she doing here? Because she's never, you know, they live a long way from the office and, or, and she works a long way from the office. Oh, I was coming here to do a skin cancer check. Now I'm a person that does skin cancer checks every, every six months as I'm meant to. I've had a whole bunch of BCCs burnt off my face and all over me really. I've had a lot. Got my uncles with half their nose, you know, because they played too much golf or spent too much time in the sun without uh, sunscreen. So I've always been aware of this and I, I was asking him about it. He says, oh, she comes over here because this one uses AI technology. I said, huh? I, oh, I'll look, I'll go and have a look. I just want to know about it uh, for my talk. And uh, I'm just dead curious what he does. So I went down, had a look, and then I decided I'll just... Might as well just go through the process, see what goes on. And um, basically, you go in there and he says, you know, you know, in the normal process, you go in, how many people get their skin checked? Okay, all right, so you got like 70% of the room. Um, but you go in, they say, take your shirt off, what has changed? And you go, I don't remember, I don't know what's changed. I've probably got spots I can't see. And uh, then he gives you this chart and I'm right at the top of the chart. Uh, there's one, one group above me, the redheads. He shows me this, poor red dog there. And, um, so he, he, and he takes all these photos and they start popping up on his screen over there. And then all these little circles appear and he has to check all these. I just thought that was uh, amazing. And to get, get, get an idea of the scale, uh, we have 1,300 people die a year from melanoma, right? Now, that number used to be horrific before all the, you know, the dermatologists got really good at detecting this. When I was young, I had a, a series of people I knew that ended up getting melanomas. Uh, they used to, um, well, the 16,000 cases that are detected. So you can see that um, they uh, have a pretty good success rate. In the old days, that number, 1,300, would be approaching the, the 16,000. So pretty bad. 90% uh, of cases are successfully detected if they catch it early, right? And there is more skin deaths than car accidents. So that's a pretty bad number, right? So I'll tell you, um, and I should tell you, if, if you don't like nudity, just look away for a second. Everyone look away if you don't like nudity. Because I'm just going to show you. That doctor found this, and I'll tell you what happened. Um, and if you don't like blood and guts, look away for a sec. Look down. Okay, so he, um, he said, oh, one of those circles, one of, one of them was a red one. And he said, oh, that uh, apparently is, that's an ugly duckling. And then on the right-hand side, if you remember, there was a whole pictures of other people's melanomas, and they, they do a, like, basically, it's, it's machine learning and it's just matching it and it goes, look, they're the bad ones and your one looks pretty close. So I'll just take a biopsy of that and I go, oh, cool, thank you very much. And I wasn't, like, I'd only been checked a, a couple of months before that. So I wasn't expecting anything. And he called that night after I saw him, he just called me on my mobile and at seven o'clock, I'm in the office. And I said, hey, doc, what are you calling me for? Am I dying? He goes, uh, I've cleared my calendar. You need to be in the office at nine o'clock in the morning. So 
that is just uh, a pretty amazing example that uh, he said it was uh, one that could enter the bloodstream in six weeks because some of them are fast growing. So I, was, I got lucky and I recommend using AI to, uh, to scan yourself if you're potentially, uh, uh, potentially you know, in danger with uh, skin checks. So let's talk about the next one. So I want to talk about um, no-code AI. And prompt engineering is, you know, is taking over a lot of people's jobs or helping a lot of people with their jobs. We have marketing assistants who are going to be prompt engineers, content writers, social media managers doing their tweets with prompt engineering, graphic designers, they all should be using prompt engineering. We're, we're using DALI and Midjourney a lot. You know, people like court stenographers sort it out with prompt engineering. Pop stars can make your own songs now. Software developers, we're going to be essentially prompt engineers. Woodworkers obviously will remain woodworkers. And um, yeah, we'll see. But uh, even, even them, you never know. Six months ago in um, Oslo, I took this screenshot because I said in the next six months, there's going to be a ton of jobs that say prompt engineers. And here's our site from Australia. Uh, I was actually wrong on this one. There's still no jobs there. But I was partially right because now there's chat GPT jobs. And so if you have a look, there's 19 jobs. So obviously it's a growing thing and that's the start and it's going to be massive. So what you want to do is you want to have an AI mentality uh, for everything that you can do. And the way we went through this journey is, first of all, we created a whole bunch of rules. You can see uh, these were bad and good ways of how to um, use like good prompts, bad prompts, et cetera, to be, you know, just like Google, you have to be good, good prompt engineer. And then um, we, like I made a, quite a big deal about being visible in the usage. All of a sudden, people that wrote very short emails were writing me very long emails, okay? And, you know, I, actually it really annoys me, really annoys me. Um, and I think it's actually a good thing if you're using ChatGPT, but be visible. So we said, look, every time you use ChatGPT, acknowledge it. Um, what emoji would you use? The what? The Red Bull. The robe. Oh, the robot. Yes, very good. Okay, so right up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, you'll find out later what you get from those. So um, basically, yes, we use the robot, and the robot emoji. We uh, like. Uh, we've got we've got a whole bunch of these rules. You can have a look. But if you use it exactly, then we put double robot. Like if we copied it. If you if we were inspired to get to a good answer, then we do that. Now you'll notice that Microsoft have just started doing this themselves. They've started uh, adding AI assisted content. Okay. But yes, if you used if you edited the result, we just put a little emoji there. Now uh, the reason for that is uh, we also have some reports that shows who's using. Uh, you know, AI stuff in their work a lot and who's not. And I'll show you, show you that a little later. But it's a little tool called Eagle Eye. Now, the other thing is when people come on board, we have an induction program where they go through, they start learning about uh, how to use ChatGPT and which jobs. And in this case, they're doing some work and they should uh, paste that content and say, proofread this for me, paste paste the content, so get a check before you ask a human's uh, advice. So at least get the first bit and question it. Just like you'd, you wouldn't show a letter you're about to send to a client without getting rid of all the red squigglies, I hope, or running a spell check. If they're doing a scrum task, in the old days they used to, if they didn't understand something from the scrum guide, they would ask a scrum white robe in our company. We have a bunch of these people we call white robes. Now we say, just say to ChatGPT, you are my scrum coach. I have a question about blah, ask that. If you still are unclear, then ask a person. So I have a whole bunch of these um, cheat sheets, which I can show you, and I'll, you're welcome to come and pick them up at the end. I even have them, uh, our marketing uh, girl, Camilla, she gave it to us in matte and gloss. Yes, highly strong. <laughs> and I have one for devs and for knowledge workers. And uh, we even 
put them everywhere. We try to keep reinforcing this. We have them even in the toilet. She can't get away from them. Um, so no downtime. Now, the next thing is keep up to date. Now, the way we did this, and it was awesome for us, and maybe you might do something similar. We just had a weekly meeting. It was a couple of hours meeting, and we rotated uh, a couple of engineers on and off. And we wanted, the, we wanted to understand what they were doing, and we wanted to know the usage as well. So we built a whole, a whole lot of things changed with these meetings. We've so far had 40 of them, um, but after the meeting, we just summarized what went on, who was there, et cetera. Um, and on and on and on. It's been uh, incredible just to share the knowledge across the place. One of the ideas that came out of it was um, switching our little icon on the bottom right-hand corner, which had been Zendesk for years. And it worked okay. You'd ask your question, hey, you know, can you help me? And uh, one of the marketing team would reply, yes, what would you like? But that's eight hours a day and there's 24 hours a day. And they give inconsistent answers, which uh, is not optimal. Uh, and most of the time, people ask. They would, the, the responses can be a bit slow where people are checking things out and you know, a marketing person asking a developer that type of delay. And um, most of the time when they do it, they would say, sorry, there's no one here. Uh, an email has been sent. We, we will get back to you via email. That's what it used to say. So we put this little guy here. And now, straight away, it says, uh, you can ask any question that's on, content on the site. Who is Adam Kogan? There it is. I have a project that I'd like to discuss. And this is the out-of-the-box answer that it gives. That's great. We'd love to hear more about your project. You can book a free initial meeting with us to discuss. And there's a click. We didn't put anything in there. It just worked the whole thing out. And the traffic that we got from our chat was way more than we ever had. Plus, if you think about the time that was spent uh, versus before, because there was a lot of marketing time spent on this, um, the, the time just disappears because it's almost always just doing, uh, it, does, it does have a handoff feature, but almost always it's answered everything they need. It's, it's pretty phenomenal. And you know, we've implemented this several times and it's, uh, it's incre incredibly good. Now, after that, there is something called um, Power Virtual Agents, which became Microsoft Copilot Studio. How many people are familiar with this? Just a few. Okay, almost no one. So this came out of the Power Platform team, and they had something similar before, but you had to program in every type of question. So you'd have to program who is, and the answer, um, you know, you have to program answers, uh, questions in about if they're asking about skills or they're asking about projects or whatever they're asking. You had, and when it hit a, a fork that it didn't have, it just said, oh, sorry, I can't help you. Can you rephrase the question? But obviously, um, that's not good enough in the chat GPT world. And so this has been uh, redone. It uses um, the open uh, AI APIs. And it works internally in your company out of the box. If you want to use external stuff, you can just do this. You go in there and put the source of, of web pages. It'll spider that. And then that's the, that's the answer. So you can just say, who is Adam Kogan? It gives that from the site. So very similar to the other one. Um, you know, do you do not, .NET consulting? Works it out. Nothing programmed at all. So we have, uh, this one really took me by surprise. When we finish a PBI in the company, we often record a video of the feature working. And uh, sometimes some of the other non-devs, if they want uh, to change the way that we work, we do a, a web page or we do a video saying to do it this way. Uh, one of the accountants, uh, which really surprised me, uh, wanted everyone to use the Uber app and, and put it on them, whatever the company spend rather than you know, some people were just doing it and getting themselves reimbursed later, things like that. So he, um, he just made a video uh, himself by just writing out the prompt of what he wanted. He just uh, used ChatGP to generate the script, and he basically wanted them to use the, you know, don't do it the, the old way, use the Zero Me app, use Uber Business, please. So he writes the script out. 
and uh, there's, there's the script written for him. And then he put the script into um, Speech Studio on Azure, and it turned it into beautiful sounding American voice, if that's beautiful. And um, uh, yeah, there, there it was. And so, you know, it's, it, obviously this is new. Hi, this is Jimmy from SSW. Today, I am excited to introduce a game-changing tool that will revolutionize the way we manage our travel expenses. Uber for business. In our fast-paced work environment, getting to client sites or attending meetings efficiently is crucial. Before we embark on a journey with Uber for business, let's right. take a quick look at our current process. So that's just an example. Is that still going? I think it is. I apologize. It is. So um, that is an example. And obviously, it was a first draft. If I have feedback or somebody else does, he just um, updates the, the prompt or the script and sends it through and he's got a new version. He doesn't have to sit down and re-record it. So pretty cool. OK, let's jump in and talk about the actual low-code um, solutions. And these are the custom GPTs. How many people here have got themselves in, into custom GPTs? OK, so I think maybe uh, 10 or 20% of the audience. Um, now, this is a very fast growing and new area. Um, and I should tell you, the way I did it in Oslo was to go through, you know, build a vector database, call all the APIs. It, um, basically, what it was saying is every time you have a whole lot of text on like a documentation site or whatever it is, a website, you should have an icon for usability in the top right or the bottom right. And that little thing lets people ask over the content rather than just doing a Google search or using the search feature. So in the case that I used in Oslo, um, I was just showing how you set that up and you would ask the question. Now, I should tell you, if you want to know about that, you can watch that video. But that whole solution could now be a custom GPT. Okay. Sadly, probably everyone in Norway is doing it the wrong way, but we can learn now the right way. So what's a custom GPT? It's everything that ChatGPT can do, plus it has a retrieval aug augmented generation, so you can train it on additional data, which was essentially in that case, that example, I used the rules. Uh, you give it uh, the instructions, which is the prompt template, which in the prior example I built was the um, system message, and then have the actions, so you can connect to any API. Now, uh, there is a rule there, you can read all the steps to do it, but I will just tell you the effect of people understanding how you can do this. So we have this procedure that one of the non-devs, uh, well, actually an account manager that doesn't write code, saw all this and thought, oh, hello, I can fix a thing that has a bit of pain. You're not meant to throw it at me, I'm meant to be throwing at you. Okay, so, um, when we have, say, a new client, there's a process. You know, you go through, you look at their website, you look at all the documentation they've given you, you go through, you check with another colleague that you're up to speed with what's going on so you don't turn up like a stunned mullet. And so he, he wrote this. A non-dev wrote this. It's called SIMP, SSW Initial Meeting Pro. And depending on who you are, before the meeting, you have to do this. So if you're a developer, you click this, and then you have to go through a series of things. Now, I just, when I, I observed that he'd built this, I thought it was hilarious. So you go through and it says, all right, so the first thing you gotta do is give us the URL of the client, and then it tells you a bit of information, so it gets you up to speed, it asks you a few questions, and now you turn up to a meeting warm instead of cold, because it's already made sure that you've done a whole series of steps, it's checked your understanding, and it's way better. Even funnier, I went in and, uh, you know, the scrum, he, this guy, Levi, was doing a scrum course. And because he's a knowledge worker that is good at using custom GPTs, during that course, he made a GPT because he's learning about the scrum guide, he's going through that, and then he made this. And that class was blown away. Wow, you are so advanced because he was a non-dev on a 
in a group of devs. And he says, the CEO has asked me to drop everything I'm working on and start something outside of the sprint. What should I do? That should never happen, by the way. And he's got all these answers. So he's getting up, like, he up the speed. Now, what is even more amazing, I saw that and thought, oh, that's really cool, Levi, really cool. So I thought, oh, I'll go and have a look and put in my presentation. Do you think I could find this thing? What? I couldn't find this stupid thing. I knew the name. I couldn't find it. This is so incredibly popular already. Every Tom, Dick, and Harry has already done this. So I know that you know, only 20% of you have done it, but you're already behind the times. People are already doing this for real all the time. So I'll tell you the story of a dev, OK? Now, I, should, I probably shouldn't tell you this story because this is one of the worst things in our company. And it's a very painful thing. And I kind of always thought people complained to me because I set it up. And uh, <laughs> they just like to dramatize things because I knew I set it up and it worked quite nice. And basically, somebody would call up and say, I want to book somebody out for a week. So all we do is open Dynamics. I think uh, this was done back in Dynamics 1.2. So it was a long time ago, but it's very simple. You just put in the thing and it does a calendar appointment. And so um, they, I've been told this several times that you have to check this to see if someone's free. You've got to go to the calendar, log in as this person, SSW bookings. You've got to navigate to a calendar, create an appointment, set the dates, double check it's right. You know, and sometimes there's an error. Yeah, sometimes Dynamics has an error, but you know how people catastrophize things. Now, Gert is one of our really um, up, upbeat guys. He, he's a lot of fun and runs um, our office in Melbourne, and he sent me a video. Um, now, just, uh, sorry, I forgot the last point. Yeah, they keep telling you how it takes like eight minutes to do this. It's not very often. You know, I don't think it's that big a deal. And he sent me this video. All right. I'll just, uh, I'll play the video so you can experience part of it. Um, I'm Gary Donner, account manager at SSW, and it's been three hours since my last video. So booking consultants on clients is really fun. I'm going to give you a quick demo of how it currently works and so that you can share in my joy. So first of all, our first option is through Outlook. We all know Outlook and we all know and love Outlook. So we'll go to our, our appointments and you can see there's so many to choose from. <laughs> For this scenario, I want to change Lou Parker, one of our best consultants at SSW, to work on SSW for a little while. Luke is currently booked on C. All right, I'll, I'll speed through this because he just does it un, in, unnecessarily slow. Um, and I was worried about his mental health by the end of it. <laughs> but look, I know when I set it up for five, it was a lot easier, but it has become a bit harder. But I, it's not something that I really want to crack open the code for and touch any of this stuff. Anyway, all right. All right, oh, Bernie. OK. So anyway, that is Gert um, complaining. And Callum built this uh, GPT, and, he, and this is how it works. When is Callum next available for a week? I need to book him to the project Northwind. So it responds like this and says, Callum is next available for a full week, starting this date to this date, below us some details. And it puts it in a nice little table, because sometimes there's, there's a several devs that you book, so the problem gets harder. And it said, would you like to proceed with the booking? which is yes, please, and it calls the same uh, API. Now, that, that successfully booked it. All it really did was put this one record into Dynamics, and it sent uh, an appointment to the client and to the dev. That's it, all right? And so um, you can see it successfully put that appointment in, and it just works. So there's the five, the five green blocks mean that week was booked. Now, what? What this does is it's a very nice UI. It clarifies you know, who's booked, checks availability. Um, it works with nicknames. Uh, you can use voice. And 
it takes 30 seconds to do the job rather than the eight minutes, right? It's not, um, it's not monumentally better, but it's a lot better. But the thing that shocked me was he built that in two hours. That whole thing was built in two hours. Uh, is that incredible? Amazing. So, yeah, if you want to watch it, you can watch the whole kit and caboodle, how he put it together, and I'll give you this. Now what I want to do is talk about the, like our bread and butter, which is building enterprise solutions. And this is a product that we ended up calling Eagle Eye. Um, and it, it just, like we have a lot of data and a lot of unstructured data. And I'll tell you the story how this came about. So in our company, we have a whole different way of approving things. You know, you can send an email, get approval. People send Teams messages. Some, some processes are in, say, Microsoft Forms, and they go through Power Automate, and then they end up in um, Microsoft approvals. We do a ton of stuff on um, GitHub. So there's a lot of pull requests. We've got zero, so there's, there's uh, approvals in there. And we've got sugar learning, which is our induction system. When you start, you have to do all these things and get things checked or approved. So we had a meeting once. Uh, we have these brainstormings. So this came up, and it said, there's a lot of people that get blocked by approvals. And we're trying to work out, well, who does all the approvals? Because really, you can go to a series of different people um, as long as you get another person to check it. But some people like doing it, some people don't. Uh, we call it um, the four-eye principle. As long as you get a second set of eyes, you're good to go. But we had no visibility on who's overloaded, who's doing most of the approvals, and who could help. So here's a very common example. If somebody gets an email checked by somebody else because they want a second opinion before they add that feature, or they send that email to a client, or they want to change a process. If the person reads it and says, yeah, that's good, we put it at the top check by Yuli. Good? So it also gives the person that's receiving it, this is valid. Like a couple of people say, this is right. This is what you should do. So now, one of, you, know, you know you've got a slight problem when one of the people take a process and start making fun of it. So Wixie, is Wixie here? There he is in the back row, yeah. So I, I added this in because I did think it was funny. Wixie took um, a, um, one of our rules and fed it into GPT and said, can you make a song? We're often singing um, Country Roads in the office. So he, he said, can you make a song? And if you look down this thing, it's a, it made a whole series of verses. And, you know, you could get... So when he got that, he, he pasted the verse into uh, Suno, which is... Uh, uh, AI music, you can choose whether you want country or rap or you know, pop or whatever. So he chose country, of course. And um, we ended up with a song. You're welcome to sing along if you like. Far when doubts arise, a second look makes, makes your, your email, email wise. Check by, check by. Sure, it's right. Check by X, X, X. <laughs> All right, you got the idea. Was that awesome? Yes. Now, I do need to tell you. You could have done that in one step, Wixie. So if you um, use Bing, you can, uh, Bing, is now we've got a reason to use Bing, right? It took, it took a long time before there was a reason. But you could do that whole thing in one prompt. Done. Yeah, hot tip for today, use Bing. All right. So during that meeting, when we were trying to work out all the blockages, we sat down and we essentially worked out that some things are synchronous. Sometimes we need to um, have real-time access. We need a second, somebody standing over someone's shoulder checking it. Um, and that's like, usually in our language, a, a Teams call, a collaborative. Uh, and a lot of those are people when they're making suggestions, new employees, People want to change processes, um, different things like that. We have a whole lot of 
asynchronous approvals where people want a new phone, they, they enter this stuff, they press submit, and somebody approves it, right? So these are non-blocking, and most of them go through Microsoft approvals. Uh, but zero me expenses are the same type of thing, okay? They're all async. So we ended up realizing that we had asynchronous approvals and we could report them that fairly easily because it was in a structured form. And we had all the unstructured stuff in pull requests and emails, et cetera. So that is when we realized, let's get all that emails, GitHub, Azure DevOps, and throw that into a custom tool, Eagle Eye, how are we gonna solve that? So we built an AI solution. We had to choose, are we gonna use .NET, Python, or Java? Who'd choose .NET? All right, almost all. Who would choose Python? Two. And who would choose Java? Okay, send that guy out. <laughs> he's a rogue, he's a spy. No, you would never do that. Okay, then we had to choose which approach. Should we choose a rule-based system, a traditional app where you put things in like the, the old um, Power Virtual Agents, do it the way I did in Oslo with the um, LLM integration or use Semantic Kernel? Well, I think we'd all prefer to use Semantic Kernel, C Sharp, right? Much, if you love C Sharp, you'll love this. So you can essentially feed in a command, like create me a series of tasks to complete a marketing project. Once you're done, summarize them, send it to, to my team. It will feed that in. It will call all the appropriate um, uh, AIs. It will come look, look for all the appropriate data and then send back and say, here's the email with the summarized tasks in it, okay? So that ended up making Eagle Eye. And I will I'll just quickly give you an idea of this. There is a longer video you can watch. It's Hi, I'm Isabel from SSW. Today, I'll be talking about Eagle Eye. Eagle Eye is this amazing software that we built that uses AI to analyze and report on your company's emails. Let's dive into it. In all companies, valuable information are often buried in unstructured data, like to turn your company's million emails, appointments, or pull requests into actionable insights. Okay, so you can look at that later if you actually want to know what the actual tool does. I want to take you through what's happening underneath. So there's a trigger. It pulls uh, from connectors to different data sources. Uh, then it uses AI to categorize things, and then it stores the data. So, and then we visualize that in our case in Power BI. Now, the first thing I was really, really concerned about, because when we did uh, Oslo, that was expensive. And I didn't know how expensive this was going to be, because uh, actually it's quite frightening. When we did that, it was based on rules. We have a lot of traffic on rules, uh, rules.ssw. And when we put the little icon up there, we knew every time somebody clicked on that, it was costing money. And we didn't know like how much, how often is that going to be clicked? How much traffic is it going to be? And we knew just from internal usage, it was noticeable. Now, now the costs are way lower. I just want you to take a look on the, on the purple stuff. The purple stuff, and, and forget the big guys for the moment, these, the purple is almost nothing. Compared with the Azure cost of running this, it's almost, you don't even notice it, it's minute. We were doing tests and rerunning the entire thing each, every now and then, and every time we do that test, it does cost, um, you know, it costs basically a coffee, I guess. Uh, so we've got 106 employees, 320K emails, um, there's 166 API calls, and I'll, you'll work out why, what we're calling and what we're not calling. Because we only call it when we need to. So that's the thing to be aware of. And you know, every time you're doing a, a full-on index, you would uh, cost more money. So here's the tech stack in our case. So there's a ton of e emails. We have GitHub at the top, all, all the pull requests and stuff we do, Azure DevOps. And they go down in each one of its own container apps. And then we call uh, the open API, the open AI APIs when we need to. And then we end up feeding that into a database so that we do all the reporting on. Now, I want you to tell you, tell you just a little one that was a curly one. And I hadn't thought of this. But we don't usually say, uh, often we don't write, hi, Damien. We often refer to the person as Damo or... Um, 
Baza, we have, in fact, I have a real example here that I took, and this was for the Eagle Eye production itself, where it said, check by Wixie, Goldie, and Cookie. Now, I want you to look at that, Wixie, Wixie, which one's Wixie? Okay, Matt Wix, there we go. And Goldie is Matt Goldman, and Cookie is Luke Cook. It wasn't, that, that's, that, we have a lot of data throughout our company that looks like that. So how does that work? Well, we pass that into OpenAI. So there's, there's just the, the guts of it. What will it come back with? So we say, who checked the email? Now, I just want you to be aware, this is not exactly what we did. It's a massive oversimplification. But I want you to know the results come back like this. It's smart enough to work out whatever it works out. Now, of course, that works. You think, great. So. Of course, you need to make sure that we know when it breaks because this is kind of fuzzy logic, isn't it? And uh, so we create a whole set of integration tests. We, we have a mock, we have a whole series of mock emails. We prompt OpenAI. It confirms it matches as we're expecting. So that's just an example. Um, if you look over on the right here, you will see that, you know, in this case, um, it says Wixie Goldie. Nobody calls Callum Cal, I don't know what's doing there. And Daniel wrote this, Big Danny, I think he has dreams of being called Big Danny, but nobody calls him that. And nobody calls me Cogwheel, I don't even know what that is. But the first half of that is real, and that's, what, that's the actual test they wrote. And there's a whole series of that stuff. So for example, I'll give you an example of some of the output here. This is who's getting their, who's helping others by checking emails? I did not know this data at all. So I was fascinated when I saw it. I didn't know that Yuli in the last year has checked 597 people's emails, right? So he's helping people. He's getting them better. Yes. He's thinking, kill me. <laughs> uh, he does 14% uh, of the company's uh, email checking. I'm the second best helper um, and peers. By the way, this came out like several months ago. And all of a sudden, uh, I start noticing every time I have a conversation with John, he wants me to put check by John. He wants to be on. So the gamification does work. You might think, uh, what's going on at the bottom there? It can't be more than 100%, right? Why is it 136%? Because that was my first question. Anyone know why? Multiple people check. You're spot on, sir. Spot on. Gee, all, all the brains are on the left-hand side of me. Okay, so now uh, there's other, like I'm just giving here, here the reverse, but the reverse here is who is asking for help? Yalel, she's asking for help. She's asked, you know, in the 90, for 31% of her emails, she's asking for a lot of help. Who's she? Well, she's new and she wants help. Uh, Nick, he's an established um, uh, software developer, he runs uh, Teams. And you know, he sends sprint review emails and different things. He's collaborating with a lot of people. He probably put a, puts a lot of people's names on those emails. But you get insights as to people doing taking too much load and people not taking much load. And there's hundreds, this is an endless list of information from our GitHub, our Azure DevOps, our emails, and our other data sources. So um, who thinks this is cool? Who thinks this is spooky? Oh, quite a few. So most people think it's cool. A few think it's spooky. I, if you went and saw Scott Hanselman the other night, he was saying, uh, somebody asked him how you, um, uh, how do you respond when people tweet you about a bug? And he says, well, uh, if I haven't heard about it, I'm interested and uh, I look up telemetry. And if the telemetry says it's 17 people in the world, 17 people in the billions of people that use this, I ignore it. I don't care. But if I see that the telemetry says it's a lot, and then he said something like, we're not spying on you, we're just getting numbers. So like, it's a little different here. You're inside a company, the company's emails and pull requests of the companies, uh, but it can be helpful. Uh, I'm sure it can also be dangerous. So we collect a whole lot of unstructured data. We build the Power BI reports, but it has triggered a lot of meaningful conversations. And we certainly have improved uh, the processes that we were looking at um, 
and then we've seen learned other things. It's, it's awesome. Data is useful. Uh, the team has a whole series of um, things in their in their backlog. Uh, they're doing more ca categorization, they're more customization to let people change all the rules, and we're improving the provisioning experience so that when somebody signs up and says, I want this for my company, there's more automation going on. So you can have a look at the backlog if you're particularly interested. You can go to eagleeye.com and grab this. Now, this is a paid service, but if any of you want it for free for your company, all I ask you to do is send an email to me today that says, I attended NDC and I want it for my company for free. That's all I want. Okay? So uh, if you're interested, do that. Uh, SSWeagleEye.com. Now, I just want to talk about the future. Um, I find this, like, there's a few things I can think of how all this stuff is touching everyone. I've just been in China. I was in, uh, we went uh, for a weekend away. We we're in a remote village and we're talking to some Chinese guy there in, um, in uh, Yellow, Yellow Mountain and he's, he brought up Sam Altman and the sacking. And I'm thinking, this was at the time, I'm thinking, Wow, that makes it here. I just was, I just did not think that was outside the tech world, all that carries on. And then I was in Greece. How many people have been to Greece? Right, so I'm on this remote Greek island, staying at this place, it's, it's called uh, Ikaria, and the boss says, can, the hotel owner, he says, can I uh, talk to you tomorrow morning? I said, sure, I'll talk to you. And uh, then I went and met with him. I didn't know what he wanted to talk to me about, but I, I figured it must have been something to do with tech because he knew what I did. He says, I want to AI my hotel. Can you help me? <laughs> they just, like AI, even on a remote Greek island, I want to do it. Whatever it is, can you help me? How do I do it? You know, it's a very vague thing. So when you talk to someone about AI, some people are spooked about a whole lot of stuff. And I think all of us a little bit. And other people are very energized by all this. And it really comes down to, are you thinking about replacing humans or enhancing humans? And that's kind of where we're at. So six months ago, this is my slide from um, uh, Oslo, we had OpenAI and they were doing things. And we were almost certain that Google were releasing something, uh, especially since they uh, kicked this whole thing off. Uh, Meta were doing something, IBM was doing something, and uh, I talked to all the guys in China, and Tencent was the thing that was imminent. So what happened? Well, Sam Altman said, I think we're at the end of an era where it's going to be these like giant, giant models. Okay? I don't know why like is in his statement, but he's basically saying there is the big players, they've made theirs, like, we're not going to keep building massive things. The, the investment is too enormous. And this is what we have now, those big players. We now know we have GPT-4 Turbo. We now know we have Gemini. Okay, Bard's been renamed to Gemini. Llama, IBM, well, we don't know where we're at there. And Tencent have theirs. In addition, in addition, we have Claude from Anthropic. We have Pi, Mixtral, and Ernie from Beidou, which is China's um, Google, right? So they're the big, the big guys that we have. So Sam Allman wasn't exactly right, so be careful. Um, you know, no one, even those people that close to it, can predict it perfectly. So these are my predictions six months ago. I said, you're going to see that we're writing code, we're cl having code clone, push, pull requests, where the builds, the tests are all automated and it's going to be looking at stuff, seeing errors, looking it up and fixing it for you. Uh, now, it is possible it's going to be feeding its output into new input. So, how many people saw Damo's session today? Just a few. Okay, so he did an awesome demo where he played a video. Uh, I've just changed this a little bit so I don't clobber exactly what he did. But essentially, this is where, where, where we're at. You know, is the GitHub handle, so I should just go back so it's clear. Um, see here, we want this little rollover, the rollover pops up the image, and we want to put the GitHub handle. Let's just say the, the product owner asked for that. Can we show the GitHub handle? Sure. 
It will then say, is the GitHub handle displayed on the active gallery cell? It will create the spec. It says, currently, no, it's not displayed in the active cell. And proposed, yes, it will be displayed on the active cell. Okay. And then it makes the plan and you can check the plan. And if you're not happy with the plan, you press that little pencil and you check. So it will, it will define a stylized component. It will import the, the cell size, add a conditional rendering, adjust the image element, and make the text gold. So it will be yellow. OK? And it's made the, um, so it goes off, and you hit this thing called implement. So this is kind of like our genie. You click that guy, and it put tick, 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 tick. All those things have been done. I was able to successfully do all that. Those files have changed. There's two files. What's in the files? We can have a look. We can modify that if, if you spot anything that you would like. OK. And then at the top, you check it's built. You can then go and have a look at it um, and say, well, that looks good. I can see ice key is written there now. It's just as I want it. And then you come back and you hit create pull request. So um, there it all is. There's nothing more to do. You press merge pull request, and that's cool. How many people think that's amazing? <laughs> How many people don't believe it's going to happen? Oh, a couple. Well, I think you're going to be wrong, that's for sure. So there is a, a tool here called v0.dev. How many people have heard of v0? Not many, less than 5%. All right, so this is... This is an interesting tool. Everything that Vercel is doing these days is pretty cool. Create me a pricing plan. Like, like imagine the scenario. You're on, a, you're on a phone call with a client or a product donor, and they're saying, you know, I, I was wondering, can I have a pricing page? Can you kind of make it in three columns? Uh, can you do this? Can you do that? And you're writing all it down because you'll have to do it later. But instead, you copy that, and you paste it in here, and you see what it gives you. And it gives you that just from that prompt. And you go, Screenshot it, you put it in the Teams chat and go, yeah, something like that. You go, what? What? How is that possible? So um, it is pretty phenomenal. This is the, um, the UI. So you've got the history of all the things you've done. You've got uh, the, uh, the different alternatives you can use for different styles down here. Um, now, the kicker, when you press that code button, that's when you get to find out how much this is going to cost you. Uh, what do you think? What's a reasonable price for that? Mr. Weaver, what would you pay for that? He'll pay 100 bucks. All right. OK. This is a lot more wealthy than a lot of us. 100 bucks for that? I wasn't sure. I thought it would be 10 bucks. <laughs> One user, right. So you click that. And you get it. It's all free. There we go. Merry Christmas. It's an amazing tool. Um, I, um, I had, well, actually, I, I shouldn't show you that yet. How many people think that they would potentially use that in scenarios? So, like 80%. Who would not touch this type of thing? No one. Oh, okay. So, a few people are on the fence. Um, I had every single person in our company try this. And they all did uh, an exercise, like a real client, style, like a realistic exercise. And because we've historically used, um, for those type of jobs, we either go to a designer or we use Balsamic ourselves or um, Excalidraw. Uh, a, a lot of people, including myself, still like doing it on paper. Um, some people use Snagit. Um, but this, this is the number of people that would use it on initial meetings and spec reviews and during development. So there is a, there is a high percentage. There, look at the red. Those people tried it and go, I w it's not ready. I wouldn't use it. But the majority of people thought it was worthwhile using it. It's just, you know, uh, it's almost anecdotal. It's just from one company. But it ha there's a trend. And, you know, there are a lot of smart cookies there, and they all seem to like it. So that's awesome. Okay. So this is kind of where we are at at the moment. We are moving from the Oracle to the Genie. Anyone heard those terms before? So the Oracle is where we've been getting all our questions answered. Um, you know, 
when I'm at dinner with my kids, the chat GPT is checking every single little thing I say these days. Um, and we have the genie. The genie is what's going ahead and answering our questions, performing all the actions, doing all that assistance stuff. Um, that co-pilot workspace example that I showed you with the rollover and adding iced tea, okay? Um, GitHub Copilot workspace is going to be phenomenal and that is going to be the genie that helps us do a lot of stuff. It's phenomenal how it's going to help us learn a lot of stuff as well. Like you can imagine not knowing C Sharp and using that and it helping you all the way. It's pretty phenomenal. Um, there is a piece that I've, I've added in here. This is just me. I'm saying that there is in the middle of all this, there's servants and the servants are performing specific tasks, um, that custom, you know, those custom GPTs that I showed you, um, the little, the, the, the booking pro one that did one specific task, called a few APIs, that is what I would categorize as a servant in the middle of the genie. So the, the AI for devs right now is apparently writing 46% of code. That's from Microsoft Stats. Of, from Copilot, so it's it's already so if you if you're not at the point where you're seeing half your code written by GPT, you're not trending upwards. It's already able to clone, edit, push, uh, so it's doing a lot of the work that we do to get pull requests uh, out and accepted. It's running commands like build and test in uh, Copilot workspace. And it's also redoing based on errors. So Copilot Workspace and v0.dev are both just uh, small examples of that. So it's starting to um, be able to do that. Now, here's the question. Is it going to be feeding its own output and creating new input? And now are we at AGI? So this is where it looks like it's heading. Artificial general intelligence is clearly going is clearly going to be better at oversight than humans. Okay, I was just talking to Will out there on the weekend. Uh, he, he's from Melbourne. And he was just telling me a story how um, uh, someone in his neighbourhood got pinged for building a granny flat, right? And I said, oh, you know, he's just saying how they have overhead camera shots, and and the guy said that he got a list from council. And it tells you the people with the biggest backyard changes. So that the backyards that have the biggest change, well, the, count, the councillor goes out and says, ah, something's going on in your backyard. Tell us about it. You know? So um, you know, we're going to have a lot of oversight. We're also, you know, we already have been at that point. We've been writing unit tests to check our code. So we know machines are good at doing that repetitive stuff. So expect the, the human oversight to start approaching zero. Okay, Event, over the next years, that's probably what we're going to see that trend down. Now, potentially, the human input may end up heading that way. That's, that's the way you go, oh, really? Like, that's what you start thinking about. So, for example, you might say, I want to, to write, I want to read a book about um, some specific thing. The book is generated for you and you read it. That's kind of a potential scenario. I want a software application and it will automatically start asking you questions. Um, you know, so we're kind of going to be answering a whole lot of questions until we get this software to perform the job that we want it to do. Now, the way it's worked so far and is that we have had human content fed into these machines, into the AI engines. And then we have had human checking the output and it goes through this feedback loop and, and it's called RLHF, reinforcement learning from human feedback. And that's how all the models have been built. Right now, there is more models coming and these models are being done with synthetic data, going through the AI models and then having AI check the output. And the brains, the big brains say it's producing amazing results, okay? And you know, in this case, you've got the, uh, the, the really Google brain guy um, who is talking in this article, but there's a lot of 
this stuff out there, which is really, um, I don't know, head scratching moments. So I will finish by telling you, um, people don't think how they feel. They, um, they will often think that they are not angry, but they are angry with someone and then they're angry at the wrong person. Uh, they don't say what they think. They will say, uh, they'll say the opposite so they don't offend someone, so it's even more confusing. And that, you know, we all know we don't do what we say. So potentially there's going to be scenarios where it's not as scary as it first sounds when you first hear this. And, you know, if you think about the amount of wasted energy on um, legal cases and things, imagine feeding that in and getting the exact right result. You know, you know, cases where humans are not very good, this will possibly be uh, an amazing uh, change and progression for us. So anyway... Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, we covered a lot of news. We covered the, the no-code stuff, the low-code stuff, and how to build enterprise solutions. Um, I will remind you that marketing assistants will be prompt engineers. Now you know that content writers will be prompt engineers. Our tweets will be prompt engineers. All the images will be prompt engineers. And uh, pop stars will be prompt engineers. I already have been. And uh, software developers are heading that way as well. So. Woodworkers are safe. There we go. So if you want to earn some swag, I'll give you the, the QR code. I will also tell you, if you want one of these cheat sheets, uh, I will put the um, just the knowledge workers ones here, and I'll put the ones for the devs. If you want a dev one, I'll put it over here. So these are the dev ones. Um, you're welcome to take those. And thank you very much.